We turn to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements she has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Engagements to take forward the Government's programme for Scotland. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, the Transport Minister said that ScotRail had learned the lessons from the chaos that passengers have endured. But in yesterday's statement, he left a series of questions unanswered. Uh, he says that ScotRail is well underway to implementing 250 action points for improvement, but he won't tell anyone what they are. And it's not for the first time. A month ago, he told MSPs on a parliamentary committee that he would come back to them with an answer. Yesterday, when asked again, he had nothing more to say. So can the First Minister give a commitment today? Will her government publish those 250 action points or not? First Minister. Uh, yes, Scott Rail will publish them within the next few days. Ruth Davis. I thank the First Minister for that answer and I appreciate the clarity. I think, of course, it would have been better if the Transport Minister had been able to give the same clarity yesterday. But as we're making progress, let's keep it going. Let's keep this progress going, First Minister. We're told that there are 250 action points, but we're not going to be told, well, well we want to be told when they're coming. <laughs> Let's look at another point on timing. On timing. Told that work is well underway to deliver them. How can we judge that when yesterday, when asked, the Transport Secretary ducked the question on timescale. The public want to know when things will get better. So we asked yesterday, no answer from the Transport Minister. You've given me one answer today that he couldn't answer yesterday. Let's go for two out of two. What is the deadline for these improvements? Can you today give us the answer that your Transport Minister couldn't yesterday? First Minister. Right. These improvements uh, cover a period of time. There is a summary of all of these these action points that are, is already on ScotRail's website that any member of the chamber, any member of the public indeed, can read. The full detail of each of the 246, to be precise, action points will, as I say, be published over the next few days. Now, what they cover are improvements to infrastructure, improvements to the ScotRail fleet and improvements to operations. And of course, all of this is backed uh, by an investment of £5 billion over the remainder of this decade in improving our rail services. But in terms of the timescale, Hamza Youssef made it very clear yesterday that what we are doing, pressing ScotRail to deliver, are ongoing improvements to their performance. The uh, contract that is in place right now targets uh, ScotRail with making sure that uh, 91 out of every 100 trains run within the recognised industry standard for punctuality. At the moment, uh, their performance is 89 out of 100. That is not good enough. So the various action points that are covered in this plan are about improving that service and beginning to see improvements in that, that service immediately. And I think we should all get behind the Transport Minister as he seeks to do that. Ruth Davison. Oh. And we were doing so well. So now we've got a government that is only now a month on starting to reveal the improvement plan that a month ago it said it would get on with doing so. But it also this week floated an alternative plan and it raised the question of a public sector operator running the rail system. We need to ensure that any of these options are realistic. So can the First Minister tell the Chamber what is the earliest that such an operator could take over a rail system? And if, as the Transport Minister says, the rail network isn't a poor service, why does she think it's necessary? First Minister. Well, we had a commitment in our manifesto uh, to make sure there was an option. We haven't had the powers to do this previously, but we now have the powers. So we said we would make sure there was an option when uh, the franchise is next up for renewal to ensure that there is a public service bid able to compete for that franchise. Now, I know the Tories are no friend of the public no. sector. Privatisation is and always has been the watchword of the Tories. But we want to make sure that there is a public service bid able to compete the next time the franchise comes up for renewal. Renewal. Uh, the earliest that could be, uh, as the uh, member is aware, is 2022, and we will start making plans now to ensure that that is possible. That's why Hamza Yousaf, as he said in this chamber yesterday, has invited all of the transport spokespersons from all of the parties to a meeting to start talking about how that can be delivered. I would hope that is something all people across this chamber would welcome, and it's yet more evidence of the action this government is taking to improve our railways. Ruth Davison. 
Presiding officer, even the First Minister would admit that this week the rail network's been in a shambles. Commuters standing on platforms have watched as the Scottish Government has blamed the train operator for the mess, and the train operator has said that the Scottish Government is responsible for how many seats are available and therefore how much overcrowding exists. The contract has at least six more years to run. And the question that passengers want an answer to is pretty simple. When they've seen the events of the last week, over the next six years, how can they have any confidence at all that this deal is going to work? First Minister. Firstly, in terms of capacity in our railways, uh, we are working towards plans that will deliver 200 new services, 20,000 more seats per day and better journey times. Uh, that's what we're purchasing with the £5 billion of investment that we're putting into our railways. And I should say, that I think about 60% of the cost of running our railways in Scotland comes from government funding. That compares to about 20% south of the border. And while performance on our railways right now, as I have said, as the Transport Minister has said is not as good as we want it to be and we are determined to see it improve. Uh, the performance of the trains in Scotland is slightly better than the GB average. Uh, so we take our responsibilities seriously and I would think it is better for all members across this chamber to back the Transport Minister as he works to make sure that ScotRail is delivering the standard of service that the travelling public have a right to expect. Question number two, Kezia Dugdale. Do you ask the First Minister what engagement she has planned for the rest of the week? First Minister. Uh, among other things, I will be in Cardiff tomorrow for a meeting of the British Irish Council. Kezia Dugdale. Today, there was more delay and disruption on Scotland's rail network. At one stage this morning, one third of trains were running late. Yet again, thousands of people were delayed getting to work. But earlier this week, the Transport Minister, Hamza Yousaf, said it isn't a poor service. And in her answers to Ruth Davidson, the First Minister did what her government always does. She blames Labour and then talked about England. Does she really think that the thousands of people delayed at Glasgow Central today care what happened in 2002 or what's going on in Cornwall this morning? First Minister. Well, I am not particularly interested in what's going on in Cornwall this morning. I am very interested in what's going on uh, in Scotland. And what... What uh, has happened this morning, as members are aware, there has been a points failure affecting services to and from Glasgow Central. That failure has now been rectified. Now, I regret any delay and any disruption. And as I said last week, we apologise to anybody whose train was delayed because of that points failure. Unfortunately, these kinds of things do happen on our railways. And what is important is that ScotRail communicates properly uh, with the travelling public and that we make sure that our, the investments in our rail infrastructure to reduce the chances of these things happening in future. That's why the investment plan in <laughs> operations, in infrastructure, in fleet uh, are so important. So we will continue to take our responsibilities seriously. When I talk about performance under Labour, I'm not suggesting that that should in any way excuse poorer performance right now. But I simply put it... We simply do that to put today's performance into context. So for the most recent period, the performance of ScotRail was 89.8%. It should be higher than that. Uh, but that is higher than in any one of the years under the last Labour administration. I say simply, I say that simply to put it into context. So we will continue to make the investments and do the work necessary to improve our rail services. I think that is what the travelling public have a right to expect from us. I'm sure that was of great comfort to the people stranded on platforms this morning. But I am glad that the First Minister agrees with me that the service Scotland's commu commuters are receiving just isn't good enough, and that the First Minister thinks that passengers deserve better. Because in January, the price of regulated rail fares is due to rise. A passenger using an annual season ticket to travel between Edinburgh and Glasgow will have to pay £71 more next year. And that makes people even angrier. I think passengers deserve a break. And that's why today Labour is publishing a plan to freeze all regulated rail fares next year. Surely the First Minister agrees with us. Surely the First Minister agrees with us that people deserve a break, 
She has the power to give them one. So will she back Labour's call for a 2017 rail fare freeze? First Minister. Of course, we, we will consider any proposal that is put forward. We will particularly we will particularly look to see how that proposal is being paid for because we have an investment package that I have spoken about that it is important we are able to implement and deliver. Of course, we do not want to see uh, rail fares increase any more than is absolutely necessary. That's why we, at the moment, have increases in rail fares that are at their lowest level since powers over railway were devolved to this parliament since 2005. Uh, we see peak time rail fare increases limited to inflation. Off-peak rail fare increases are actually limited to inflation minus 1%. So that is the discipline we exert on rail fares. We will consider any proposals, but above all else, we will make sure we have fairness around the funding of our railways so that we can carry out the investments that are required to make sure that standards do improve on our railways. Thank you, President Officer. This is a serious proposal with means to pay for it contained within. And we asked the Scottish Parliament's independent experts to cost it for us. And they have estimated that it would cost as little as £2 million. Now, that's the equivalent of two months' profit, two months of a belly profit. People are fed up with expensive, overcrowded and unreliable trains. And the SNP are desperate to talk tough about what action they might take in 2022 that passengers left stranded on freezing platforms this morning need a break now. Yeah. So doesn't the First Minister agree with me that after weeks of misery, passengers in Scotland deserve to know that there is light at the end of the tunnel with a fair freeze in 2017? First Minister. Firstly, I've said we'll look at any proposal that is put forward um, and I will stick to that commitment, but we've also uh, been bearing down on rail fare increases already. As I said uh, to Ruth Davidson, a much bigger proportion of the funding of our railways in Scotland comes from government funding as opposed uh, to rail fares than is the case south of the border, and I think that is right and proper. But we will also make sure we plan the investment that is required to improve the infrastructure, to improve the trains and to improve the operation of our trains so that the kind of delays we are talking about just now are not seen in the future. That's the responsible action we will continue to take and I think that is the action the travelling public have a right to expect. Yes, we will look at the option of a public service bid in future, but right now we will continue to focus on making the improvements that people want to see. We have a number of constituency supplementaries today. The first one from Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the First Minister what the response is of the Scottish Government on the news of the proposed closure of the Quick Fit Insurance Services Contact Centre in my constituency. First Minister. Well, I am, of course, aware of the proposed closure of the Quick Fit Insurance site in Uddingston with the possible loss of more than 500 jobs, and my thoughts are with all of the workers affected at this time. Uh, the Business Minister, Paul Wheelhouse, has already spoken with senior management uh, and uh, are looking at options. He has underlined our full support for the Uddingston site and its workforce uh, and said that we are committed to working with North Lanarkshire Council and others to do all that we can to retain jobs. Uh, Scottish Enterprises working closely with the company to consider all possible avenues for support and we will continue to engage throughout the consultation process. It is important that we give the site and its workforce the full support they need and deserve at this difficult time and we are absolutely committed to doing that. Edward Mountain. Presiding officer, as a, a result of some very unsatisfactory clinical outcomes at the maternity unit at Caithness General and indeed one mum, Ailey McIntosh, having to endure her labour in an ambulance on the road between Wick and Raidmore. It appears that NHS Highland are proposing next week, without public consultation, to downgrade the Caithness uh, General Maternity Unit to a, a, a midwife-led unit, with Raidmore becoming the hub. Knowing that childbirth can quickly become life-threatening, not only to mother, but also to child, is the government happy that Caithness and Sutherland mums with difficult deliveries might have to face a two and a half hour blue light drive to Inverness, which could be considerably more in winter. And would, would they not join me and hopefully the First Minister and the Caithness residents and local councillors in asking for a full public consultation before these changes are automatically imposed? 
First Minister. Well, this is a, a very important issue that's been uh, raised. Edward Mountain first uh, raised the case of an unsatisfactory ambulance uh, journey. And I want to make very clear that the standard of care received in that case fell way below what we would rightly expect for women in Scotland. And I expect both NHS Highland and the Scottish Ambulance Service to act on the findings of the investigation and make improvements to local services to ensure that mothers and babies can be transferred safely and comfortably whenever uh, they need to be. Uh, on the more general issue, uh, as the member is aware, uh, NHS Highland published a report into the safety of maternity and neonatal services at Caithness uh, Hospital, um, and they will further consider uh, that later this month. The report was triggered by the death of a baby in Caithness Maternity Unit in September 2015. Uh, and on the, the basis of that report, the medical director will recommend that Caithness Maternity Services are reconfigured and should operate as a midwife-led community maternity unit. Uh, the recommendation is being made on the grounds of safety. It's supported by external review. That is the reason NHS Highland are not proposing to consult uh, on the decision and it will not come to ministers. Uh, however, they are proposing to consult widely on the proposals to strengthen services in Ragmore and provide facilities for parents to ensure uh, that they meet local concerns. I hope that all members would recognise that where a report makes a recommendation on the basis of patient safety, and it's clearly on the basis of patient safety, then it is incumbent upon the local NHS board to act accordingly. Marie Todd. Thank you, presiding officer. The First Minister will be aware of this week's announcement that a buyer has been found for the smelter, the hydroelectric plant and surrounding land in Fort William, currently owned by Rio Tinto. Can the First Minister provide an update? First Minister. Well, Rio Tinto informed its workforce and the Stock Exchange yesterday morning that it had reached agreement to sell its shareholding in Alcan Aluminium UK to the GFG Alliance in a deal that has been is being supported by the Scottish Government. I think the sale is great news for the local community and especially for the 150 plus people working at the Fort William Aluminium Smelter. The uncertainty hanging over the workforce since the strategic review was announced in January has been lifted, ending an anxious wait for the workforce and all those whose livelihoods depend on the business. Uh, this deal not only safeguards the existing jobs in Le Cabre, but it also has the potential to create hundreds more through planned investment in new facilities. And I hope that everybody across the chamber would warmly welcome it. Jackie Bailey. Is the First Minister aware that cuts are being made to mental health services by Western Bartonshire Health and Social Care Partnership as a result of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde's budget cuts for next year? Is she further aware that the SNP group leader voted with the unelected health board appointees in favour of these cuts, whilst Labour councillors voted against? And does she agree with the SNP group leader's actions in voting for cuts to mental health services in my area? First Minister. Well, firstly, Greater Glasgow and Clyde's uh, budget is not being cut next year. It is increasing in line with the budgets of other uh, territorial health boards. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is that this government is committed to continuing to increase the NHS budget uh, overall and over this parliament by £500 million more than inflation, which is a, a bigger commitment that Labour made in their own manifesto. So that is the reality of the situation. In terms of uh, the, the particular issue that Jackie Bailey raised, I am not uh, aware of the, of the particular local issue. If she wants to write to me about it, I'll make sure that is looked into. Uh, as I've said before, the health service, because of rising demand, uh, faces real pressures, but we are determined to work with the health service to give it extra resources so that it can meet those pressures. And within the overall NHS budget, we've made clear our commitment to increase funding for mental health services as well. Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At this very moment, the City of Edinburgh Council is meeting to approve its local development plan, a document that will see thousands upon thousands of new homes built in my constituency, putting intolerable pressure on health services in Kirk Liston, South Queen's Ferry, Castorfin, further choking arterial routes that are already ranked as the most polluted and congested in Scotland, and in addition, tearing up much-loved green belts and natural heritage in areas like the Camo Estate. Now, I accept there is a housing crisis in this country, but there is a housing crisis of a different kind in my constituency. Uh, the citizens of West Edinburgh are on their knees, groaning under the weight of new houses that we are forced to endure. Will the Scottish Government bring forward a new planning bill 
which seeks to uh, rule out development in areas that are not sustainable, which compels developers under Section 75 orders to, in the first phase of development, build things like new health centres and roads infrastructures, and will she define once and for all what is meant by Greenbelt, like Camo, and protect it forevermore? Thank you. First Minister. Well, I'm more than happy to look into the detail of the issue that the member raises, but as I sit listening to the question, I'm struck by two things. Firstly, uh, this is a, a question that appears to be criticising the Scottish Government for a council wanting to build more houses, uh, given that many members in the opposition across this parliament frequently criticise us for, according to them, not building enough houses. It seems to be a rather contradictory uh, way of attacking the government. But, but secondly, from a party that is usually standing up in this chamber, know, accusing absolutely. the Scottish Government of centralising decision-making, <laughs> to now stand up and ask us to pass legislation uh, to restrict the local decision decision-making of a local council seems to me to be entirely on its head. So, you know, we will continue to make sure that the planning system operates uh, effectively, uh, that concerns of local communities are taken into account, but that we can see expansion in house building, which is much needed across the country. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I ask the First Minister when the Cabinet will next meet? First Minister. Tuesday. Patrick Harvey. The uh, Cabinet hasn't left itself much time now uh, between yesterday's Westminster budget statement and the need to introduce a draft budget for next year for Scotland. The, the statement yesterday at Westminster was accompanied by a great deal of rhetoric about protecting people who are just about managing, but it contained a great deal more good news for the wealthiest. Some 85% of the income tax cuts over the course of the rest of the Parliament will go to the richest households. The people who have been given some light relief uh, in changes to universal credit, that only restores a tiny fraction of what's already been taken away from them. Uh, and the uprating of the uh, so-called national living wage, the upper band on the minimum wage, won't get anywhere close to the real living wage and also won't protect younger workers who at the moment are the most exploited in our economy. The Scottish Government can take action on all of these. Does the First Minister agree that the Scottish Budget must not only avoid reproducing the same unjust policies that are being pursued south of the border, but must result in a cumulative benefit to Scotland that closes the inequality gap and leaves far fewer people in Scotland genuinely struggling? First Minister. Uh, yes, I, I do uh, agree with that. Our budget will be published, of course, on the 15th of December. Um, I think it's important just to talk about the context uh, for this Parliament and this Government of what the Chancellor announced yesterday. It doesn't surprise me Ruth Davidson didn't want to mention the autumn budget statement in First Minister's questions today, uh, because even after the additional capital funding uh, that was announced yesterday that we will benefit for, from through consequentials, our budget by the end of this decade will be 9.2% in real terms lower than it was when the Tories took office and the effect of the £800 million uh, yesterday meant that instead of our budget by the end of this decade being £3.3 billion lower than when the Tories took office it will be £2.9 billion lower and the Tories want us to be thankful for that. In addition to that of course uh, we saw uh, the, the universal credit situation remain largely unchanged, which mean that the, the autumn budget statement yesterday was a case of uh, taking money away from the poorest to give it to the richest in our society. I think it was us seeing the Tories uh, showing their true colours. Now, uh, we will set out our budget plans in full on the 15th of December, but of course uh, we have already said that we will not uh, pass on a massive tax cut to the 10% top income earners in the country, because at a time when our budget has been hammered by the Tories, when public services are being hammered, when we're seeing £100 billion of additional borrowing because of their Brexit recklessness. This is a time to protect our public services and to protect the vulnerable, and that's what this government will do. Patrick Harvey. You see, that, that goal is one that I share, but I do hope that we can move away from the, the language of passing on tax cuts south of the border. The Chancellor down south doesn't set tax rates and bans for Scotland. It's the Scottish Government that will set them. So there's no question about passing on. It's about deciding what is right for Scotland in the first principles. It seems pretty clear that there are specific actions that must be taken if we want the Scottish budget to have the effect 
that the First Minister is saying she wants to achieve. We should be saying, for example, uh, that uh, all workers, not just workers over 25, uh, will get the, the genuine living wage and have the kind of conditionality on that for government support that the Scottish Government has shied away from. We should be using the capital spending to cut people's living costs on areas like energy efficiency. We should be using devolved powers to top up benefits. A top up to child benefit could lift tens of thousands of children out of poverty in Scotland. And we absolutely must avoid protecting wealthy people like ourselves in this parliament and have progressive tax policies that save money for people on lower incomes uh, and raise it from those who can afford to pay more. Does the First Minister agree with me that it's dispiriting to see the Labour Party, for example, say that it's middle earners who would, ben who would uh, be cost more money if we raised the higher rate. Higher rate taxpayers are on high incomes. Shouldn't we expect that people on high incomes pay a bit more? First Minister. Well, I agree with that last point. Higher rate uh, income earners earn over £43,000 a year. My judgment is that it's not right to give a large tax cut to the top 10% of income earners at a time when those at the bottom end are suffering so much and when there is so much pressure on our public services. That's the judgment uh, we make and I think it is dispiriting, especially after some of the rhetoric we've heard from the Labour Party in this Parliament that we heard John McDonnell say that uh, they actually agreed with that tax cut uh, for uh, top earners. Now in terms of some of the other points uh, Patrick Harvey raises, he will appreciate that uh, I will not go into all of the detail today because the Finance Secretary will set out the budget in due course. Uh, but if we look, for example, at energy efficiency, this government has and will continue to invest heavily in energy efficiency. We will uh, continue to do everything we can to mitigate the effect of welfare cuts. And I would hope everybody across the chamber, well, perhaps with the exception of the Tories, uh, would welcome the fact that we have managed to confirm that our work programme will not have sanctions attached to it, something that I think uh, will be warmly welcomed. Uh, and in terms of uh, the, the minimum and living wage, although we don't have the power to set the minimum wage, we've made very clear that we want to see the extension of the real living wage, uh, and I've already extended it, of course, to 40,000 social care workers. So these are the kind of actions we will continue to take to help those most in need and to protect our public services. And when we publish the budget, I hope the whole chamber will back it. John Scott. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister is aware that NHS Ayrshire and Arran have a less than good track record going back many years regarding not disseminating and acting on information gained and lessons learned following critical incidents and significant adverse events. Pattern of failure for too many bereaved families is well established. And while I welcome this latest review into baby deaths at Cross House, we have been here before and the questions remain. Given that lessons have not been learned and acted on in the past, does the First Minister really believe and can she guarantee that the outcome of this inquiry into baby deaths at Cross House will deliver improvements for the people of Ayrshire and my constituents? First Minister. Well, firstly, I think it's fair to say that changes have been made. Uh, the review that John Scott uh, referred to, the earlier review, was uh, one that I instigated when I was Health Secretary in 2012. That was a review of Ayrshire and Arran's adverse event management. Uh, but some of what we've heard this week, of course, is deeply concerning, and that's why the Health Secretary uh, has asked Healthcare Improvement Scotland to review the cases that have been highlighted in Ayrshire and Arran, uh, and indeed any others that they believe are necessary, and report on whether the correct processes and procedures uh, were properly followed. Healthcare Improvement Scotland will report back at the earliest possible opportunity, after which the Health Secretary has offered to discuss these findings uh, directly with the families concerned. And I can give an absolute assurance to the Member and to Parliament today that if there are lessons to be learned or improvements to be made, we will not hesitate to act. Neil Findlay. The Justice Minister has instructed Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary to review undercover policing in Scotland. This week it has emerged that one of the key officers working on the review is Stephen Whitelock, who was previously Deputy Director of the Specialist Force that was responsible for carrying out the undercover policing activity that he is now reviewing. Will the First Minister step in and, review, and, and remove Mr Whitelock from the inquiry? Otherwise, its credibility will be in tatters before its work has barely begun. First Minister. Well, I will fully consider uh, the, the issue that Neil Finlay is raising, but I think more generally, as he said, the Justice Secretary has 
directed Her Majesty's Inspectorate to undertake a review of undercover policing in Scotland. It's important that we allow that review to proceed and then uh, act on any of the findings of it. But I want to make sure, uh, we all want to make sure that there is confidence in that review. So, of course, we will consider any issues that are raised that might damage that confidence. So, without saying any more about that today, I will look at the issue uh, and come back to the member in due course. Stuart Stevenson. With the Brexiteer chimera of £350 million a week for the NHS, replaced by the Chancellor yesterday by £225 million per week of new borrowing, does this not make it much more difficult for governments north and south of the border to deliver social justice when our economy is being burdened by debt of this magnitude due to the incompetence of the Tories? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Um, yes, I, I think that is absolutely correct. I think yesterday we started to see, perhaps for the first time, laid bare the true cost of Brexit. Uh, and rather than there being the promise of £350 million extra a week for the National Health Service, what we saw yesterday is that the additional borrowing, just the additional borrowing caused by Brexit will amount to £225 million a week. That's the Brexit con that so many people in the Conservative Party have presided over. That's why I'm so determined that we continue to explore every option to protect Scotland's interests and in particular uh, to protect our place in the single market because that's how we minimise uh, the costs of Brexit that are being imposed on us by the Conservative Party. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, last month, the First Minister voted for a Green Amendment in this chamber, setting out clear red lines to protect Scotland's public services and environment from the CETA and TTIP trade deals. Yesterday's vote in the European Parliament confirmed there will be no scrutiny of these deals by the European Court of Justice, while this government's written answers confirm that CETA poses a potential threat to our NHS and our protected foods. Will the First Minister release the legal advice that points to damaging impacts what action will she take to make sure Scotland's voice and Scotland's values are heard in Europe at this critical time? First Minister. Well, the, the member is aware of the position laid out in the Ministerial Code around uh, legal advice. Um, secondly, and, and this is a matter of regret to me, we do not have direct power over uh, trade agreements like CETA and TTIP. However, uh, where I do absolutely agree with them is that it is incumbent on the government, I think incumbent on the whole parliament to make sure that Scotland's voice is heard. And as I've said previously, we do have concerns uh, around some of the contents of both CETA and TTIP, particularly around the threat to public services, uh, including the NHS. And we have argued that there should be an explicit exclusion for the NHS and public services in agreements like this. We also have concerns over the investor state dispute resolution uh, process. So we will continue to argue the case that Scotland's uh, concerns should be taken into account and we will absolutely make sure that Scotland's voice is heard on these matters. Question number four, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to the Autumn Statement. First Minister. Uh, the Autumn Statement starkly set out the cost of Brexit to the UK economy and public finances, with economic growth and tax revenue revised downwards and borrowing and inflation sharply up. In responding, the UK Government had the opportunity to end its failed austerity policy. Instead, the Chancellor has continued with the cuts that are reducing budgets for public services and cutting the income of families across Scotland. While the small increase in capital investment announced yesterday is welcome, this is simply reducing the cuts that were put in place by the Chancellor's predecessor. By the end of the decade, our capital budget alone will still be around 8% lower in real terms than it was when the Conservatives came to power in 2010. We will publish the Scottish draft budget next month, and this will set out the measures we are taking to support our economy, tackle inequality and invest in public services, underlining the very different approaches our two governments take. Bruce Crawford. Uh, th thank the First Minister for her answer. Would the First Minister agree with me that the full extent of the Tories' reckless gamble with the nation's future is now laid bare for all to see in the autumn statement? As she says, with slower growth, higher inflation and tax revenue down. Do you also agree with me, First Minister, that the bombshell projection that the UK debt will now increase by, to a staggering, by a staggering £220 billion by 2020 if there is a hard Brexit? makes it an absolute imperative that Scotland is able to remain in the single market by whatever means. Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Well, 
You know, the Tories don't like to hear this because what we are hearing now is the reality of their recklessness on Brexit. £100 billion of additional borrowing, debt increasing by around £200 billion, debt to GDP ratio hitting 90% lower growth and lower real wages, uh, a real squeeze on living standards. Uh, that's the price of the Tory Brexit that Ruth Davidson and our colleagues seem now to be so enthusiastic yes. about. Well, the Tories in Scotland might be the born-again Brexiteers, but this government will continue to stand up for Scotland's interests. We will continue to seek to protect our place in Europe and yes, we will continue to find ways to protect our place in the single market because that's what we need to do to protect jobs, to protect public finances and to protect the living standards of people across this country because none of these things are safe in the hands of the Tories. Nigel Fraser. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I suggest if the First Minister wants to find Brexiteers, all she has to do is look at the benches behind her. Yeah. Now, the Chancellor's autumn statement delivers for Scotland £800 million extra capital spending, £74 million extra resource spending, £3.3 million extra for Scottish charities, a freeze in fuel duty, an increase in the personal allowance to help the lowest earners, an increase in R&D spending and a city deal for Stirling and Clack Manager that the constituency members seem to have forgotten about in this question. And all this as part of the fastest growing economy in the G7. Why can't the First, why can't the First Minister for once stop being so miserable and just welcome this good news? First Minister. I think most of the misery yesterday was coming from the Chancellor, not from anybody on this side. You know, I remember the days when Murdo Fraser used to aspire to be a serious politician. Now he is simply delusional. You know, the facts speak for themselves. And, you know, let's, let's take account. Let's take account of the 800 million extra in capital, of the 74 million extra in revenue. Let's factor all of that in and see where we end up. We end up in a position where by the end of this decade, by the end of this decade, our budget will not be 3.3 billion lower than it was when the Tories took office, as we were expecting. It will just be 2.9 billion lower than it was when the Tories took office. And yet the Tories expect us all to thank them for that. Well, that is the price of allowing the Tories to run our economy. And the difference between Murdo Fraser and the Conservatives and those of us in this House is we think we'd do a better job of running our economy yeah, yeah. ourselves. That's the choice that faces us. Question number five, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking in light of recent reports that Scotland's children are some of the least active in the world. First Minister. Well, some of the findings of the Active Healthy Kids Report Card 2016 are disappointing and we want to do much more to challenge sedentary behaviour and increase the physical activity levels of children. But as the report recognises, we have a strong legislative and infrastructure in place that underpin our plans. Uh, through the Active Scotland Outcomes Framework, we're committed to provide even more opportunities for children to be active, building on our massive investment in school sport and in sports facilities since 2007. I'm sure the member will share my disappointment that the UK government watered down its recent childhood obesity strategy and I hope he'll lend his party's support to our call for further restrictions on junk food advertising before 9pm to significantly reduce children's exposure to the marketing of unhealthy foods. Alexander Stewart. I thank the First Minister for her response and I do welcome uh, the government's efforts to encourage physical activity. However, according to the Scottish Health Survey, the SNP have only managed to increase the number of children meeting physical activity guidelines by a few percent since they came to power. Does the First Minister admit not enough progress has been made on this? First I Minister. certainly readily acknowledge that we've got to do much more, but let's look at you know, children doing two hours or more uh, periods of PE, for example. In 2005, uh, that was less than 10%. Uh, this year, that's gone up to 98%. So that's just one example. 
of the progress that has been made and we're investing heavily in local sports facilities. Uh, the report that uh, the member's question referred to, the Healthy Kids Scotland report card, uh, found that we score very well in terms of policies and facilities, but in terms of actual physical activity of children, there is much more we need to do. That's, for example, one of the reasons why we're supporting the Daily Mile in our schools, which is an absolutely fantastic initiative. So we'll continue to make sure that the facilities and the investment that we're ensuring is translating into actual improvements. And I hope that on this issue, because it is so important, not just now, but for the future, I hope that people across the chamber will get behind us on this. Question number six, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to tackle the problem of nuisance calls. First Minister. Well, I know the significant harm that nuisance calls can have, uh, particularly on the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, much of the power to tackle the issue lies with Westminster, and indeed this weekend we did see some positive action, but I believe there is more that can be done to tackle this issue. Uh, the Scottish Government held a summit in June with representatives from UK regulators, telecoms companies and consumer groups on what practical steps can be taken. And it's why on the back of the ideas generated by the summit, we outlined plans in the programme for government for a nuisance calls commission, uh, which meets for the first time next week. Uh, there are, of course, no easy solutions to this. However, the response from our commission members, again, that's regulators, business consumer groups, and the UK government shows there is a willingness to make a difference to protect consumers and tackle unscrupulous business practice. James Kelly. I thank the First Minister for that answer. I'm sure the First Minister will agree with me that nuisance calls are unacceptable, particularly as they're often used to target the old and the vulnerable. The scale of the problem in Scotland was highlighted by UK statistics published by which earlier in this week, which showed that Scottish cities occupied three of the top four places in the proportion of nuisance calls. In Glasgow alone, over half of all incoming calls to true call customers were regarded as nuisance calls. Can I therefore ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government will make use of the new consumer powers and publish a bold action plan eh, which will put pressure on businesses to protect consumers and help, vun help vulnerable people by supporting the provision of call blocking technology? First Minister. Um, yeah, I broadly agree with, with everything that the member has said there. I absolutely agree that nuisance calls are unacceptable, particularly when, as they tend to do, target older and more vulnerable uh, people. Uh, obviously, much of uh, the, the action that can be taken here is reserved to Westminster, but that doesn't mean that we will not explore whatever action we are able to take. There also is evidence, he's right to point out, uh, although there's no clear explanation as to why this is the case, that nuisance calls are, are higher and more of a problem in Scotland than they are uh, in other parts of the UK. Uh, he's also right to point out, of course, that we will have uh, further powers over uh, consumer policies and we are actively looking at how we use uh, those policies in a way that can make a contribution to tackling uh, this problem. And uh, obviously, call blocking technology is one of the areas uh, not just the Scottish Government, but other governments uh, are, are looking at. So I'm very happy to continue a dialogue on this with any member across the chamber who is interested in this as we seek to work out how we can best tackle what is an unacceptable and uh, I think most people would agree a growing problem particularly for older people in our communities. Question number seven, Daniel Johnson. To ask the First Minister, following the recent call by Save the Children, what action the Scottish Government will take to increase the number of teachers and other staff working in nurseries with specialist training in speech and language development? First Minister. Our national practice guidance published in 2014 focuses on the communication needs of babies, toddlers and young children in a variety of settings and it makes recommendations for best practice. Uh, of course, we're already committed to expanding free early learning and childcare, including to the most vulnerable two-year-olds, uh, and by 2018, providing nurseries in the most deprived areas of Scotland with an additional graduate or teacher uh, with early learning expertise. In addition, the investment provided for delivering early learning and childcare entitlement will support the delivery of different models of provision. For example, holistic delivery models, such as the Woodburn Family Learning Centre in Midlothian, co-locates early learning and childcare alongside other services for children and families, including speech and language therapists. Daniel Johnson. Uh, I'd thank the First Minister for that answer. Um, she restated her commitment to expanding childcare, and we share that aim. But isn't it the case that over the last five years, Scotland's nurseries have lost over 900 teachers under her government? How does she square that fact 
with the, the promises that she's just made. First Minister. Well, we are uh, not just committed to expanding early learning and childcare in the future, we have expanded early learning and childcare and of course uh, we published uh, not too long ago the financial review of the expansion of that policy to date that showed that if anything the Scottish Government has overfunded uh, that commitment uh, with local councils but of course we are working with local councils now to plan uh, the further expansion um, and the commitment around extra teachers or graduates in nurseries and deprived areas is an important one. So too is the flexibility that will be encompassed in the expanded provision because that does give us the opportunity to look at different models uh, of provision such as the one that I cited in my earlier answer. Uh, there's no doubt at all that the key to uh, solving this issue is early education and that's why it's important that we look at expanding not just the quantity of it but the quality of it as well and uh, the early years Minister Mark Macdonald is absolutely focused on doing both. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to move on to members' business in the name of Miles Briggs. This is about disability access to Waverley Station. Could I urge members in the gallery, we're, we're trying to get new members into new um, members of the public into the gallery. So could I ask those who are leaving to do so as quickly and as quietly as possible? And there'll be a short delay while we wait um, for the gallery to be cleared. Great, thank you.